And now, please welcome Atlantic Senior Editor, Van R. Newkirk II. In August of 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, which among many things, abolished literacy tests and poll taxes designed to disenfranchise black voters. Now, 56 years later, the VRA's fate is hanging in the balance as conservative lawmakers target the very changes that helped more citizens vote in the 2020 presidential election. Here to discuss the fragility of voting rights in America, I'm joined by Sherilyn Eiffel, President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Sherilyn, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. I want to set the table before we start talking about voting rights today and everything. I want to set the table talking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Mm. What was that law intended to do and how have we strayed from its roots? You know, Van, um, I think that one of the, the uh, good things about this moment is that it's compelled people to, to ask the very question that you're asking and to actually return to what was happening in that period and what the intention of Congress uh, was in that period. So first, a little piece of history. Um, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution is the, the, the middle one of the Civil War Amendment. 13th Amendment ends slavery. 14th Amendment uh, in, ensures birthright citizenship so that those uh, black people who were formerly enslaved and free black people who had had their citizenship undermined by the Dred Scott decision are now citizens of this country and promises equal protection of the laws. And actually, when you really get into the 14th Amendment, it also includes something about voting. It's actually got a formula that would punish Southern states if they didn't allow black men over the age of 21 to vote. And then the 15th Amendment is purely about, about voting. It's basically, you know, you can't deny uh, the ability to vote to people on, on the grounds of race. Um, in the 14th Amendment and in the 15th Amendment are what we call enforcement clauses. And those clauses say in explicit language that Congress shall ensure that these amendments, that the, the rights uh, articulated in those amendments are enforced. And it's from those enforcement clauses that Congress gets its power to pass civil rights statutes, right? Because they're enforcing the guarantees under these amendments. So the Voting Rights Act of 1965 reflects Congress exercising the power that it had failed to exercise for 100 years, right? Because we get the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment after the end of the Civil War, and Congress you know, passes the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and dabbles a little bit, but it, it turns its back essentially for the entire 20th century to the reality of voting discrimination. And it takes Brown versus Board of Education, it takes activism, it takes the civil rights movement, and of course it takes death and sacrifice and blood and the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the Voting Rights Act to be enacted. And when Congress passed the Voting Rights Act, it recognized that this would be an ongoing problem. And so it included a section of the Voting Rights Act that was known as Section 5, which essentially required particular states that had a history of voting discrimination, mostly in the South, to submit any voting changes they wanted to make to a federal authority to have them approved before they could go into effect to determine whether or not they were discriminatory. It is an extraordinary civil rights statute. It's seen as the most effective civil rights statute ever enacted. Even Ronald Reagan called it the crown jewel um, of civil rights. It, is, uh, it was a model statute. And today we are watching it dismantled piece by piece. So I imagine that has kept you very busy. Yes, it has. What work is the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund doing right now in combating this state of affairs? Yeah, you know, one of the things I do like to remind people is that voter suppression is not new. I joined the Legal Defense Fund as a baby lawyer, uh, maybe a year out of law school, um, as a voting rights attorney in 1988. Uh, and I litigated voting rights cases for five years. Um, so this has been going on for a long time, and it's not new. But it is new. Um, th what is new is the intensity um, and is the concerted uh, voter suppression effort that's been unleashed. It has been allowed to happen because of the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County versus Holder case in 2013, which removed uh, that formula that I just described to you. And, and now these jurisdictions no longer had to submit their voting changes for preclearance. So now they could do things they never could have done before. 
And that's been the switch. That's when the uptick began to happen in 2013. Um, and so we've been kept busy uh, litigating voting rights cases, um, doing serious on the ground election protection work. We have seen the emergence or the reemergence of voter suppression tactics that we hadn't seen in a long time. The level of voter intimidation that we saw in the 2020 election, particularly in the primaries, is something I've never seen in my career as a civil rights lawyer uh, across the country. And so we've had to deploy our resources to fight new forms of voting discrimination, but also to remember how to fight old forms of voting discrimination that have been resuscitated. So we sit in this moment of, of peril for voting rights. Mm -hmm. But also one that lots of people would say is a, a, a moment of promise in some ways. There are people finally thinking about legislation to close the gaps that were opened in Shelby County versus Holder. Where are we in that uh, fight for legislation and what do you hope we can get done? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, this, this is a moment of tremendous challenge. It's not just civil rights challenge, it's democratic challenge. Um, you know, I have often said that the effort to keep fellow citizens from being able to vote and participate in the political process is a democracy problem. It is fundamentally anti-democratic. Uh, and so it's a challenge. But it also, as you say, is an opportunity because I think many more millions of people in this country are recognizing it as a democracy problem because they have seen what happened last year. They saw January 6th and they see what's happening in states like Georgia and Florida and Texas that are passing these new voter suppression laws. And they understand that it's not possible to explain in any way that makes sense a law that denies or, or criminalizes uh, the effort of anyone to provide refreshments to someone standing online uh, who wants to vote. Voters stood online in Fulton County, Georgia last year for up to nine hours to vote in the presidential primary, seven hours in Harris County, last um, you know, ballots cast at 1 a.m. Uh, and why would you pass a law in response to that that says you can't give uh, water or food to someone standing on a line? People can see what that is. So that means there's opportunity and there is legislation in Congress to deal not only with the Shelby County decision, but to expand voter access, to provide automatic voter registration, to guarantee early voting, to uh, loosen the restrictions on absentee voting, uh, which really came to the fore last year during the pandemic. So it's a moment of opportunity, but it's by no means a foregone conclusion because what used to be bipartisan uh, support for the Voting Rights Act has now gone the way of almost everything in this political moment, uh, which is that Republicans are opposed, unfortunately, to provisions that will expand the electorate, particularly expand uh, the, the electorate for black and brown voters. And so uh, the likelihood of the passage of, this, of these bills is very much uh, a day-to-day, moment-to-moment monitoring that we're doing. Now, one thing I've seen even from people who perhaps support uh, voting rights legislation in Congress is citing really high turnout mm -hmm. in the 2020 mm -hmm. election. Uh, the argument goes in, in many ways like we had really high turnout mm -hmm. in 2020. Mm -hmm. Maybe fighting these voting rights, mm -hmm. voter suppression laws is not necessarily mm -hmm. a priority. What do you say to that? Well, I say two things. One is um, the, the fact that, that, that voters were so incredible, particularly black voters, um, and overcame the barriers by standing in line for nine hours to vote, right? Um, does not mean that the system is functioning properly, you know? In the primary election in uh, Wisconsin, which was uh, in early April, um, after the Supreme Court decided that particular provisions to expand absentee voting would not be allowed, voters stood online for hours and hours and hours to vote. And I, that, the, the photograph of black voters standing online with the masks on, this was during the height of the pandemic, uh, and I remember the election was happening just as the studies came out showing that, um, you know, black voters and, and black communities were paying such a toll uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. So even though the black population of Milwaukee is 28 percent, um, you know, the deaths from COVID uh, were 80 percent black people. So black people were willing to risk it all to vote. Uh, they were willing to stand online for nine hours. They were willing to stand online for seven hours. That's not a functioning system uh, in a democracy. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is the voter suppression laws that we're seeing right now in Texas and Florida and Georgia are actually a response to the turnout. 
that's why you can't give refreshments to people standing online because they saw people standing online uh, for nine hours. They saw people using early voting at numbers we had never seen before, so they're restricting early voting. Uh, they're restricting absentee voting because during this pandemic, that's how so many people participated in the political process. Um, they're deciding that, you know, the, the Secretary of State of Georgia will no longer be the, the arbiter of which votes are disqualified and which votes are not because they saw Brad Raffensperger, a Republican, stand up to President Trump. And so now they've taken that power in this legislation away from him and the election commission that he supervised. And now the power really rests with uh, the people who are appointed by the partisan legislature to determine whose votes are disqualified and not. So the turnout last year, number one, was people overcoming uh, what they had to overcome in order to participate. It was one of the most incredibly noble sites of this fraught period. But it's also true that the voter suppression laws that are being passed this year are directly in response to the high level of turnout that happened last year to make sure that it never happens again. A cousin to the last question, uh, I, what, one thing I've noticed is lots of people kind of judge voter suppression laws based on specific laws mm -hmm. or based on sets of laws in specific states. And they try to assess whether it's going to affect turnout in this mm -hmm. one place, this one law. Mm -hmm. but, but I imagine your position gives you the vantage to see how everything's happening all together. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you can give us some sense of what that looks like and what it does. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem is that we have a, such a fractured system, right, across 50 states. Um, and what we need is greater uniformity in the system. You know, until recently, New York didn't have early voting. Uh, and it has one of the most Byzantine uh, electoral uh, processes of any state um, uh, until recently as they when they began to clean it up. So it is true that different states have um, you know, different systems. But what is also true is that we now know what are the uniform systems that provide people with the best opportunity to participate in the political process. Early voting was, you know, not something that was known when I started voting a million years ago, but now we recognize that people want that opportunity because many people can't get off election day, that it's not a holiday for everyone, that people have jobs that make it difficult for them to show up at the polls. And so people like to take advantage of uh, early voting. We saw last year with the pandemic, Absentee voting is really important because people have illnesses that, you know, that, that they are encountering, they have child care issues and so forth, and so absentee voting allows people to participate. Automatic voter registration we've recognized. So we know what the elements are that make a strong voting system and that provide maximum opportunity uh, for people to participate in the political process. And it's those things that we can enact across the board that will strengthen the voting system writ large. And Congress has the power to do it because Congress still controls federal elections. Um, and so they have the power. And they also have the power under the enforcement clauses that I talked about at the very beginning to make sure that um, minority voters are not uh, barred from equal participation in the political process. It is part of uh, the, the, the evidence of citizenship is your ability to participate equally in the political process. And when you allow laws to go forward that inhibit that, you are denying the full citizenship of black people. You are denying the full citizenship of Latino people. And that is directly contrary to the spirit and letter of the 14th Amendment. Now, looking at where we are in the year, looking forward, it's looking like the window for these big voting rights bills. It's, it's closing, seems like. What happens if we get, say, to the end of 2022 without a major voting rights legislation? You know, Van, this is going to sound um, strange, but um, people ask me all the time, you know, do you think these bills will pass? And what, you know, what do you think is the prognosis? And I always say that um, I feel confident that they will pass because failure is not an option. And when I say that, I mean that I genuinely believe that if we do not have voting legislation, um, that this country's acceleration towards um, leaving behind being a democracy will actually happen. Uh, because if you look at the, the nature of the laws that are being passed, if you look at the conduct of officials, if you look at the threats that election officials across the country are experiencing, um, you recognize that uh, power has been elevated above democratic norms. And if we don't have federal legislation to protect against that, 
we will cease to be a democracy. And in case people think I'm being hyperbolic, I don't think we were a democracy before the Voting Rights Act was passed. Because if you are allowing uh, an entire region of the state where a majority of black people live, and a majority of black people lived in the South and still live in the South, 52% of black people live in the South, and you allow those jurisdictions to deny the citizenship and the right to participate of people who are in fact citizens of the country, then you actually can't call yourself a democracy. So uh, when I say that we will um, you know, accelerate that slide towards not be being a democracy, I'm looking at the past and saying that we can return to that past. So um, failure is not an option. And therefore, it is critical. And if what is standing in the way of voting legislation are two United States senators and one Senate rule, the filibuster, then I would question our democratic bona fides if we would suggest that a rule created by senators for how they conduct their business has supremacy over the 14th and 15th Amendments of the Constitution, we would already have upended our democracy. If we're suggesting that one senator, Senator Manchin, elected by 290,000 voters in West Virginia, can decide the future of citizenship for black people in this country uh, alone, along with Senator Sinema, then I would suggest we have a democratic problem. And that's also an opportunity of this moment, Van, is that we've got structural problems that are revealing themselves in this moment. And so, frankly, yes, I want the voting legislation to pass, but I'm feeling um, decidedly more ambitious about what we then have to tackle. We have seen and we have had an opportunity to see exposed to us uh, the structural flaws in our democracy that have brought us to this point and that allow us to be so precariously balanced. And I think we have to get about the work of really fixing our democracy and fixing the structural elements that have left it so vulnerable. So you're saying not just the voting rights legislation, but above and beyond. Absolutely. I think, I think we've, we've got to be looking at the Electoral College. We've got to be looking at the filibuster. We've got to be looking at the blue slips for judges. We've got to be looking at the confirmation process. We've got to be looking at the nomination process. We've got to be uh, looking at ethics in government. We've got to be looking at all of those elements that have been exposed over the past five years. Uh, and that have demonstrated to us so clearly that the back door of our democracy is open. And if we're going to secure that back door and make sure that it is safe, then we have to take on the responsibility of citizens, which is to protect and strengthen our democracy. The Constitution was not meant to be a static document that sat for all time. Uh, and the structures that we have adopted, some of them formal and some of them informal, are structures very well suited to another century not this one. Uh, and so it's time for us to modernize and to recognize that a system that relied so much on the good faith of the actors in it uh, and that relied so much on norms and ethics and things that are not codified, now that we have seen what can happen with the Trump presidency, for example, we recognize that there are things that actually do need to be codified and that we do need to strengthen to make sure that um, we're not just relying on hopes and dreams and the good faith of someone who could wield uh, that incredible power and has access to the nuclear codes. So yes, when we get past the emergency of this year, we need to spend some time getting serious about strengthening our democracy. Now I'm going to let that be a mic drop. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you.